Happy Saturday to you all. Hope you're having a good weekend. Uh, just a reminder that you can uh, worship with us via the YouTube link in your church email or uh, the, the Concordia Lutheran Church, Concordia Lutheran Duluth YouTube channel uh, as well. It'll be up tomorrow. I'm going to continue on reading. Um, he just Our writer, James Allison, just got done uh, talking about how uh, the change that Jesus works in us um, hits us at a level of reworking our relationships in such a way uh, that we're not tied into others at the level of defensiveness, aggressiveness, rivalry, um, and things like that. And so he continues on. Part of the problem here is that we assert our independence of and deny our dependence on the social other which surrounds us. The trouble with this is that it locks us into an inability to change. Because the truth is that we are not independent of the other. Perhaps especially the person who is most convinced of his or her independence is locked to the other, which he or she desperately needs as a sounding board or counterexample, by comparison with which to demonstrate his or her own excellence. The truth is that we are completely dependent on the social other. Not only did it give us birth, and does it give us food and so on, the obvious things which existed before we came along, and which we receive as part of a long history, but it gives us language, thought patterns, even desires. And all these things we are preceded by and formed by a social other. Our learning to imitate these things is our induction into being humans. The problem is that the social other which forms us is, and was before we came along, a violent other full of the distortions, cruelty, murder, and exploitation which abound all over the planet. That is to say, along with the way in which it brings us into being human, which is a good thing, there are introduced at the same time all sorts of violences and disturbances. Each of us is locked into the social other in a series of vicious circles. That we can perceive this at all is thanks only to the presence of the crucified and risen Jesus. There would be no way for us even to perceive fully the violence of the other which forms us, unless there was something different, if you like, a different sort of other, which is not part of the violent other which forms us. This is precisely what is made present by the gratuitously self-giving victim. You may remember how early on in this book, I stressed the way in which the self-giving of Jesus to his death and the giving of him back in the resurrection were entirely gratuitous. They were absolutely outside the tit-for-tat and reciprocity of the world. However, they were not only motiveless acts of generosity. What was given was something revealing the human condition, revealing the basis of the violence by which we are all locked into each other. It took God to allow us to kill God, for God to be able to loose us from the deepest ways in which we are locked into the violence of others. Only forgiving us for that would really forgive us. Again, the word forgive means to loose only to loose us from that which would really loose us. The level at which the presence of the crucified and risen Jesus thus makes impact on our lives is precisely at the level of our identities being formed in distorted relationship with others. A different social other, if you like, breaks into the way in which we are tied in, permitting us to be loose and to have our identity, our dependence on a new Pacific other reformed. So it is the eruption of this completely new peaceful other into our pattern of relating that is able to let us loose exactly insofar as we let others loose. This is emphasized by Jesus in parable after parable and after te in teaching after teaching. God forgiving us and our forgiving others are parts of the same act. There is no forgiveness of one without the forgiveness of other. Now, in the case of all of us, this means that our whole relationship with what is other, that what with what is other other than us, changes and can be felt, however slowly, to change. We are able to loose those memories which bound us into places, circumstances, or relationships, leaving us feeling powerless and oppressed by them. We are enabled to perceive how what we have done and what we have justified to ourselves, has partaken of the same destructive relationship with the other and repent of it. Let's look more closely at what an act of repentance is. It involves seeing the discrepancy between a relational pattern of violence 
and the new Pacific relational pattern which has been made present by the forgiving victim, and seeing how we have been dependent on the violent pattern while we thought we were being free. The realization of our dependence is the beginning of our healing and forgiveness, for that means we are already starting to relate specifically to what is other than us. The clean sorrow which this realization produces in us and the beginnings of the adopting of new patterns of behavior is what constitutes our forgiveness. For it is what constitutes our new heart, our change of mind, metanoia, the deep change in our attitudinal patterns towards patterns of peace with relation to others. Catholics have the incomparable privilege of having this whole process made obvious and simple in the confessional, where the priest acts as an efficacious sign of the deep forgiveness that is being fed them by the crucified and risen Lord. Because of the gratuity of his presence, the crucified and risen Lord works at undoing the ways in which our memories and our violences lock us into what is other than us. At the very deepest level of our being, therefore, the level which makes consciousness possible, the level which the Hebrews referred to as the heart, there is no knowing Jesus, the crucified and risen Lord, without the possibility, without the possibly slow, possibly dramatic upheavals in the patterns of our relating, which I have been trying to describe. Precisely as part of knowing Jesus, we can expect the upheaval that will take us out of being the lonely hero, denying dependence on a rotten and corrupt world, into being terribly ordinary. One of the guarantees of knowing Jesus is that a person has become steadily more at home with being part of a rotten and corrupt humanity. He or she is steadily more aware of his or her complicity in its faults and violences and doesn't seek to hide that. They know that it is part of the human mass that they are able to be touched by the new sort of dependence on the new sort of other which is coming into the world as a forgiving victim. So our memories, rather than blocking us off from others, are made healthy by plugging us in with others, but in new ways. Our sins, however vile, rather than becoming a motive of separation, are turned into the beginnings of a new sort of solidarity. And if you doubt that, look at any group of Alcoholics Anonymous. We even learn to hate our sins, not as part of the self-hatred that no amount of apparently worldly success can cover up, but because of the effect they have on others. That is, the whole of our relationality is recast. Before we sing one of my favorite Easter songs here, uh, I suppose I forgot to explain that today would have been the day that the NBA playoffs would have started, and so I am wearing the uh, you know the clothing for the eventual world champion Milwaukee Bucks. We'll see if they get their act together and if something can happen and they pick up the season where it left off or start the playoffs or whatever they do. Who knows? It'll be a gift if that is the case. Grave be open, clothe 
Peace to you. Go Bucks.